Okay, welcome everybody. Uh, tonight we're going to be making picks for the 10 this Saturday, March 4th. I'm joined by Des Linden, marathon extraordinaire and 10,000 meter vet, and Will Lear, miler. And Will, what uh, what's the highest you've ever scraped the ceiling in distance? Is it a 5K on the track or a 5K? I have no idea what it takes to be a good 10K runner, but I am here for this. But you're, yeah, you're a man of sports and you like making picks. I love sports. I thrive in competition. I did win a mini golf tournament this weekend. So let's just put 36 holes of mini golf, I feel like is equivalent to a 10K. So uh, I, I'm well versed in what it takes to win this thing. Des, does that jive? Absolutely. And best dressed. So who might argue with Will? Yeah, it's t shirt <laughs> weather. Oh, and Lyndon and two. Nice. Right. <laughs> All right. I mean, this isn't a plug, but, you know. Just natural. It's the go t shirt. I woke up yeah. like this. <laughs> the shirt. Oh, it's sure, a sleeve shirt. Very soft t shirt. <laughs> it must go down to your knees then if it's a sleeve shirt. <laughs> yeah. If my knees were at my hips, you know? Okay. Styling. All right. So the 10. The 10 is Sound Running's 10,000 meter race in San Juan Capistrano, sleepy little coastal town. In Southern California. Uh, last year, it was the fastest 10,000 meter race in the world with all kinds of records being bro broken. And uh, the people love records. We know that. Um, and they, they love racing too. So hopefully this is kind of a mixture of the two of those. Grant Fisher and Mo Ahmed ran 2633 and 2634 there last year. And Elise Cranny ran 3014, just a second off of the American record. Uh, this year, records may be broken, but races themselves are shaping up to be pretty good. So, which is something that's that's pretty cool in, in my book, that not only are these going to be fast races, but there's actually some very good storylines at the front of these races. And, uh, and it's unclear at the moment, I think, who can take this. Um, the broadcast will be brought to you by our team at Trackland, and you can purchase a ticket to watch at trackland.com. Tickets are five ninety nine and four dollars go straight into the prize purse. So, I mean, somebody posted on Twitter recently that uh, the ten is their Super Bowl. So if the ten is like the Super Bowl and gets one hundred and fifteen million viewers, um, that means that sixth place will take home twenty seven point six million dollars. Make it happen. Let's do it. it. Doesn't even seem like it's that hard to do. <laughs> Well, let's do it. Um, so, Des, an honor and a privilege to have you here. Uh, you've got about a month and a half to go to Boston, right? Is that correct? I, I stopped counting. I know it's soonish. Yeah, mid mid April, <laughs> somewhere around there, when yeah. that race will happen. Are you hoping for rain, shine? It's a technical term, soonish. Um, definitely rain. I think. I recently picked a walkout song and I picked garbage only happy when it's raining, only happy when it's raining. Right. It has to be my theme song. Um, it served me well. And, you know, you talked about breaking records. Here's a broken record is time, time, time that goes out the window in conditions. So yeah, I want some conditions in Boston. Yeah. Yeah. You'd be a, you'd be a football player that liked the, uh, the real grass playing in the right. mud. No domes. Put me in Lambo. <laughs> Snowball. Yeah. <laughs> I right see on. a lot of similarities, Des, between you and Aaron Rodgers. Yeah, I just got out of my darkness retreat. It was not in a cave. It was just internal emotions, you know. But I'm feeling better. I'm down in Arizona now. So things are looking up. More yeah. metaphorical. <laughs> well, well, let's... Uh... Let's See, talk about sports fans, Jeff. Sports fans, we are yeah. dialed. We are dialed in the sports culture right now. That's right. Yeah. Well, between football seasons, I always call it the dark period, but we do get tracked during the dark period. So that's that's a shining shining light in the tunnel. But if you ask Dan Campbell, there you go. That's just a train coming at you. <laughs> so it checks out. Dan Campbell is yeah. <laughs> but Wilt. Uh, so we made picks for the Wanamaker Mile last time, and you were prescient with your men's picks. So picked one through four, 
perfectly. And the way that you told the story was how the race kind of unfolded too. Walk us through your mindset and uh, what were you feeling like as you were watching that race happen? It was more of a, like an inception type of strategy that, look, I know that these young bucks, they love to ingest media. They were going to listen to this. And it, if they listened and then they spoke their reality, so it shall be. Unfortunately, Johnny G just didn't pull through in fifth. But like, gosh, we just we wanted it so badly. Yeah, the jet. The thing is, indoor mile racing, and we saw uh, the difference between an indoor mile race, especially at the Milrose Games, and a 10,000 in San Juan Capistrano, which no one actually knows where it is. It could be in Aspen, for all I know. Um, it's – no one's laid their cards out. Like, people are racing 3Ks and indoor 5Ks. I guess an indoor 5K may be the most – applicable distance to a 25 lap race because it in and of itself is 25 laps. But when you have so many people racing all these off distances, shorter distances, you know, running out of their minds at BU, I don't know what's going to happen when they see like a more down to earth split versus just running on a trampoline. So we'll see what, maybe their minds will all explode, but uh, I put a lot of time and thought in my top five and if the bookies have anything to say about it, odds will change with the airing of this podcast. Well, let's, we're going to get there. We're going to get to talking about it, but I just wanted to point out that your man, Neil Gorley on a tear and uh, you picked him to get second. I thought that was a risky pick at, at Wanamaker, but I want to say that this last weekend of all of the outstanding performances, the Birmingham 1500, that was the race of the week for me because the two top Britons in the race, Josh Kerr and Neil Gorley, didn't dodge each other. They came to the same spot. They raced, and it was a record, a British record in the 1500 that resulted from a race strategy, too, instead of a record attempt, which was amazing. And Neil Gorley took it from Josh Kerr. Josh Kerr put himself out there as the previous record holder, and he took the pace, too. And pretty much set it up for Neil Gorley to to take that in the final lap. Uh, tried to do whatever he could to not give it to him. But yeah, I love to see those guys going at it and not afraid to jump in a race like that and, and make it something. No, I mean, hats off to Josh Kerr, right? Like that, that record doesn't go down if he doesn't step on the gas when, you know, our rabbit du jour, Eric Sawinski, uh, did a – I mean, what a beautiful job he did. But it, it takes Josh – that saying, you know, like, come and get me. Do you right? think I'm gonna make this hard? Do you think Kerr regrets that tactic? Like, I lost the race and the record, nah. or is he like, let's just go nah. all out and see what happens? I don't know Josh Kerr super well, but from the interactions I've had with him, he is a man that doesn't strike me as someone who's super regretful on his race strategy. Anyone who's that been that bold from such an early age, I mean, like, he's been the person who's been doing that since. I mean, early days at New Mexico, right? Like, oh, just give me a rabbit for 600 of a 1500. I don't <laughs> care. Like, I'm going to smash it from 900 out. I, like, it doesn't matter to me. I'm just, I'm just better than everybody else. And that's my belief. And my belief is super strong. And I have a belief in, in my strategy. And so I think like it served him better than not for, uh, you know, a lot of his career. And then in big time races, you know, coming up with that Olympic medal, that that's huge. You know, an Olympic medal in a middle distance event, like those in any event, but like, especially in the 1500, it's such a crapshoot, right? There's like, it's not necessarily about who's the fittest on the day. It's who's the most strategically sound. And so um, it's, yeah, I, I love watching Josh Kerr run. I think that he, he knew what he needed to do to like, make sure he walked off that track with his head held high. And I think he did just that. I mean, running 334 indoors. I mean, shit, I was talking to Willis after that race and because uh, we were talking his, I think his indoor 15 PB is from Birmingham as well. And we were talking about how, you know, back in our day, which was not that long ago, that like 335 indoors was a really good time. And I think his indoor PB is 335. And so to come in fourth place and run 334 is bonkers. Off half marathon training too, right? Like how good is he going to be in four months? I don't want to diminish the fact that European Championships is next weekend, 
and it's a very big deal, and it's great, and I think Neil's going to win. All of that put to the side, none of that really matters if you don't have a great outdoor season, right? No one's talking at the end of the season in December of next year when they're going to receive their Athlete of Year awards in Monaco of like how great of an indoor campaign you had. It's backing it up with a great outdoor campaign or you just had a great outdoor season because like this is, no one talks about who won, you know, spring training down in Arizona. It's, it, it's who, go, who shows up to the big dance, the big meets outdoors and can continue to, to perform. And so um, I think we have a great example on our hands this weekend. It's like the first big meet of the outdoor season. Like a lot of these guys ran lights out indoors, men and women on, on, on both these start lists. And it's like, now we're getting to the real track season. Indoor track, super fun. Don't get me wrong. I love indoor track. It's the circus of track and field, but like outdoors is, that's real track. You know what? I pay attention. I'll pay attention after this year too, especially when I'm looking at those world rankings lists and the top five performances and I'll see, oh, number four or whatever was, uh, was Josh Kerr's 3000 there at the Milrose games. Those things, now, now they'll last a lifetime, <laughs> these, these indoor performances with the new world rankings. Uh, but let's, yeah, let's- I will say, I, I, will, I just want to chime in really quickly and say that something I, because it just like, it never necessarily occurred to me, historically speaking, I know that we're all historians of the sport, but Neil posted something today on Instagram talking about the importance of winning that race and securing the uh, automatic bid to Glasgow Indoor World Champs in uh in a year's time and like again gives that guy something else the last 150 like you're always looking for that extra and, and like des you run an, an event that takes an incredible amount of courage and self-belief and like you go through a lot of dark spells and you got to have something that you draw from so for neil to draw from this like i'm looking towards not just winning this race but it's a thing next year that i really give a shit about is like that's that's a huge well to to dig from Definitely. Yeah, I agree. But let's keep moving along here because uh, we're on a we're on a strict time limit today, and we've got to get to some some ten thousand meter talk. But um, so what we're doing here this evening, and what we started to do, is we're taking a look at different races throughout the year, and uh, looking at who might win these races based on the landscape of competitors that that have been assembled on the line. Uh, what they all bring to the table, what skills they have, what are their different approaches, what do they tend to be, and how they're going to take stock of the different competitors on the line and see what, what kind of tools they brought to the table and how we think this race is going to shape up and who might win because of it. And I think that's what, what gambling, dare I say, uh, picking in general does for these, these kinds of sports is that it forces people to kind of analyze the individuals and see um, not just what they might run or what their PRs are, but what do they bring to the table that makes them a winner and how might they win this race? So uh, that's what we're going to do with the, the 10 races today. The 10 started by sound running two years ago, uh, and Jesse Williams deserves all the credit in the world for, for putting on this meet. Um, it's where some of the best distance runners in the world come to run 10,000 meters, which is a rare beast these days. You don't see the, the 10,000 meters run on the track too often, 25 laps. And uh, it is a treat when it happens. Uh, the 10 is a World Athletics Silver Label event. So the winner will get 60 points added to their, their time score for, for this race. And then it goes down from there, I believe, 50 points for second place, 45 for third. Um, in order to be ranked in the world rankings, you need two 10,000 meter races in a year. Um, and a lot of these runners don't have two in the year. If you look at them, we posted all of their world rankings if they're ranked on the track lens site. And a lot of them haven't run two 10,000 meter races in a year. So the year goes back from, from this calendar date. So this will be for a lot of them, their second race. And we'll start to see the, the rankings populate from there. But like we said, to kick this thing off, it's a mix of, of racing and a time pursuit. These things are paced and they're gonna go pretty fast. The, the times on the table to achieve world standards are 27.10 for the men and 30.40 for the women. And if you hit those, then uh, 
depending on your country's selection process, that's an auto bid to, to show up in Budapest later this year. But points are on the table as well, this being a silver label event. So a win in 2711 uh, with the 60 points added will be worth about 2633 on the world rankings list. And a win for the women in 3041 will be worth about 2936 on the, the women's world rankings list. So those are the kinds of points that you can be thinking about. The world championships field in Budapest will be 27 runners. And uh, in 2022, 13 men ran under 2710 and 15 women ran under 3040. So you're looking at, in theory, half of the field would be filled with people qualifying through the rankings list and, and not based on the auto qualifier. Um, so the 10 is, is one of a few good shots that you have to put a mark up on the board uh, and one that shouldn't be taken lightly. So I want to hear from you, Des, uh, how do different athletes react to that kind of pressure? Like when you get for a 10K and a marathon, they're very different distances than, say, a 1500 where you can get your shots week to week to week. And if you have a bad race, then like oh, I could jump back in another 15 and like and make it happen. But for these longer distance races and more so in the marathon than the 10K, you're building up for months at a time and you got one bullet in the chamber. And if that it doesn't go the way you want it to go, then you've got you got to chew on that for a while afterwards. So what is that kind of pressure like heading into these longer distances? Yeah, I think the marathon to a degree, you have more opportunities now, right? Like you can find marathons all throughout the spring and all throughout the fall like if it went totally awry you could get yourself into something you could step off and get yourself into another quality race the 10 there's just not that many runs so it's almost uh even a higher pressure situation you have collegiate meets that you have to kind of wrestle to get into and then hope that they are in good conditions um so it's it's almost a little bit more amped up and uh, I always found that really exciting. Like the put in a bunch of work, you have one opportunity. Um, when training went really well, it was like, oh, I finally get to show off what I've been up to. And I think that that's, you know, what really great competitors, they're excited about it. They're like, this is, we finally get to run the 10. We know it's a fast track. Um, and there's a handful of meets that like, you just know they're magical and big things happen there and you lock into the train and you stop worrying about the time you just compete. And at the end, you know, you get the magic number that pops up and you're like, Oh, I qualified or I got better today. Or, um, those things are secondary to just competing. So this race will be super fun. It's that opportunity for all of these people to know how to perform under pressure. And, um, this is, as I say all that, it's like micro compared to a trials and then the games. So there's always that next level. So I, they'll all be ready to, ready to go. And what's fascinating is that we're all kind of in different spots in the season and training for so many different things right now. So yes, the 10 is very important, but what are you coming off of? What are your eyes on long-term this year? Um, and all of those things will factor into how people race and, and how they look. And let's, uh, let's look at the distance and, and how people approach 10,000 meters on the track in general too. Uh, where where does the race usually start to occur? We see, especially in these hybrid situations where we're going to see a fast pace at the beginning, um, the racing really doesn't start to take place until later on, unless something really crazy happens <laughs> at the beginning. Um, but how do how do people typically approach a 10k, and what are what are the pivotal points in the race where you have to make decisions i think for me it was like you want to tuck onto the rail you don't want to be racing in any serious way like if there's a massive gap you got to make a decision do i cover it or do i just stay put do i cut half of it in half and then slowly cover the rest of it but all of those things are you know they're not very serious over the first 8k really so you get on the rail you lock into your pace whatever that may be or you stay with your group and uh and it's a rare race where you turn your brain off and you just try not to look at the lap counter until like about 8K. Will, you have the same experience? 
third lap of the mile type thing. Yeah. Uh, well, given it's funny, I love watching 10 Ks. Um, I learned to love watching 10 Ks, watching Shalane run the American record at Stanford. Um, one of the first times I ever got to compete there as a D3 athlete, you know, it was like, that was my USA's basically going to the Stanford invite. I actually don't know if it was Stanford invite or Cardinal or whatever it was. Um, but this must've been back in like 2006, maybe. Um, and, and just, just being present and watching someone go to work for that many laps, uh, it ingrained in me like this, like, I don't know, this incredible fascination with the event because previously never really thought much about it. Um, I had a college teammate who was really good at 10K, but it was always one of those events you're like, oh yeah, we'll, we'll go get some like Gatorades and hot dogs and come back and there'll be 2K to go. And that's when the race starts, right? And so like, I, in, with apropos of nothing, I was going to say 8K is when the race would start. Um, merely on like anecdotal uh, spectating yeah. of the event. It's like a lot of people can get through 8K. It's like a lot of people can get through 20 miles of a marathon, but can you get through that last 2K? And like, I don't know. I just, I feel like I've always watched championship 10Ks come down to the last 2K, whether it's Mo going to the front or Bekele going to the front and running 456 for his last 2K, right? It's like everyone's there at 8K. There's not a lot of people there left at 10K. And so it's you know, fast pace, slow pace. It doesn't really matter. It's like you can, that's where the, the cream sort of starts to separate. That's the long kick home too, right? You have the grinders who go, I can't wait for this to be a fast 800 meters. Like I got to really put the pedal down now and get the kickers out of the situation. So that's the point where you start grinding and then the kickers are just hanging on going, one more lap, one more lap. I'm licking my chops for that last 400, 200 and tapping into their specialty. I think uh, well, a similar situation to Will too. I have never raced a 10K on the track, uh, but I, I've i started to love the 10K when I drove out as a high schooler, I think in, in 2006 to Stanford and watched the matchup between Dathan and, and Alan Webb. Uh, America's best miler versus the one of the best distance runners uh, in the United States. And this was like, I couldn't believe that it wasn't being promoted more. Like you get there and, and there's this like this small audience collected in the stands. And it's, it's almost like a boxing match too, where you look at what are the different skill sets of, of the best miler in the United States and what are the best, skill sets of the best distance oriented athlete and who's going to win this thing. And they were neck and neck through the entire race, clicking off 421, 422 per mile. And then it came down to the final stretch and Webb just nipped him too. And both set PRs running like 26 or 2733, 2734, I think. But that was like, this is ridiculous. This is what I run for the mile. They're doing it six times. And they're two very different people too. So it's that like, you can be different in distance running. You can have your own unique set of skills and there's different ways to race and win here. Um, but let's get into these it's races. Corrected. My year was 2007. I went back, I just <laughs> Googled that race and saw Webb's uniform and realized it was, it was the next one. We could have been, yeah, sliding doors. Just, we could have been buddies. Ships in the night, look at us. We just... <laughs> yeah. Uh, let's get into the men's race here. This is, uh, so now we can start talking racing men's race. So we've got, we've got a slate of contenders here. I'm not going to name them all of them off. Uh, I'm going to name a few. Woody Kincaid's in here. Joe Klecker, Ben Who was Flanagan. That? Woody? That? Wood, Wood, Woodrow? Kincaid? I've never heard of him. Can I, Woody Kincaid? Can on the block? <laughs> The Woodman? Yeah, he's he's in it this time, and he's not pacing like he was last year. Uh, ben Flanagan, Connor Mance, Patrick Deaver, Sam Atkin, Luis Grijalva, Emmanuel Bohr. The list goes on and on here. Uh, Will, let's just jump in here. Give me your players. Get, who are the who are the big players in this race? 
Can I be perfectly honest? Please. There, there's one player in this race, and that person's name is Joe Clucker. But I feel like, unlike the women's race, there is it is not being set up at like a quasi suicidal effort, and so that one player now, who I I personally believe is sort of a level above the rest of the field. I mean, this man is chiseled from the ore of Northern Minnesota mines. <laughs> like Marty Cutler, Joe he is Joe Klecker is one of the single toughest people that you've ever seen run on the track. And it's like, that is just absolutely case in point of what it takes to be a 10 K runner. Just like absolute unrelenting toughness. And he has that like in droves. We've seen it now. Um, it just turns out that between him and Woody, 5K is like too short. And uh, it, it, I think over 10K, I mean, he proved it at World Champs this summer when it was a million degrees outside and just fought tooth and nail for, I think he finished eighth place overall. I mean, just an incredible effort in that in that event. And that, that to me, cemented his toughness. I, you know, I've seen him race a bunch of times and never in conditions like that where you're just like, you see someone up against the rope and Jeff, you love a good boxing analogy. The guy was like, he was against the ropes early, early and just willed himself to a top 10 finish in a domestic world championship. And so I think like he, and then coming off of this, you, I think it, there's an element of coming off of your first U S championship where you like, you feel as though not only do I want to represent my country really well in domestic world championships, but I still like have this chip on my shoulder that I am the best. And watching how he came off of last summer's racing to how he dominantly ran at BU, like out there, <clears throat> excuse me, like a man possessed. Like he, he just had a newfound self-belief that I think is super, like Frank, it's like dangerous when you have a guy that's that good. It's been that good for that long. And then it's not like he's found, unlocked a new set of like physical skills. He's just unlocked a new set of self-belief. And in the 10 K, I just think that that's going to be pretty tough for anybody to, to level up against. Um, but the list of players that you also listed off is it's, it, there's a depth there and 1335 it's above, uh, which is what is the realm of, I think what, yeah, I don't know yeah. And it, if it gets there, we'll see. Um, it, if it does again, five K's all, I, I, I'd lean on Des to say how far 5K is at the end of a 10K. You know, like if, if you're out there, was 5K, 1335 is 65, 66 pace. So it's, it's after you run 1254, that probably feels pretty good, you know? Uh, and it was just, just stupid to say. <laughs> it, it's, it, that's, it hurts my feelings to say that. And um, it's interesting I'm, how we, how we look at these things too, like the BU 5K. So, Joe had a commanding lead in that race too. And if it, if it wasn't for Woody, if you pull Woody out of, out of the equation there, all of this talk would be about Joe. Like it would be, Oh, Joe ran 1254 in, in BU. And yeah, we did say that. I disagree. But... What? I disagree. Uh oh, we got smoke on the house. It's fine. Oh no. <laughs> no, this is the disagreement alarm. Really? Okay. Look, look, we got, Hot take. Yeah. <laughs> so, a lot of hot takes. The takes are so hot, so now smoke. Cool down. Um, <laughs> I, I, if Woody wouldn't have raced a single race indoors this year, he's in the he's he's a guy who's always going to be in in contention. He's going to be in the talk. I sure. just think like a bit like Jordy Beamish, like you have races where Woody, if he's in it, he's lethal. But I think that Joe will have learned something. We've, we've seen Woody's hand this indoor season, which is I'm fit as all get out. And I'm feeling like, again, I have something to prove leaving Bowerman, joining a new coach, sort of doing things my own way and, you know, foregoing winning another national championship in Albuquerque to set up this 10 K. Um, I think on the guy side, you know, we talk about these automatic times. If you just crunch the numbers, it's like you don't you don't need to run twenty seven ten to go to world championships. You can run. I I didn't go back and and look how deep you need to run, but it's like you probably run under twenty seven thirty. You're good to go. 
you know? Um, but I, my hope is that the way that this shakes out is that they go, they, they're fairly honest through 5k and then it gets a little aji baji, a little cat and mouse. And you start to see if there were any gaps that they close up and make for an, a very exciting last two, three K because I think that's where like things will get super interesting. Who's the Josh Kerr of this scenario who won the pacer step off has to go to the front. That's a really good question. And I, I think it's Sam Atkin. Mm -hmm. I think Sam Atkin's a guy who from a variety of different, and, and I'm basing this purely on experience watching him run at Jesse's meets. So like for a, a guy who, He's going to come out and know that against his British compatriots, if he runs the fastest time, his opportunity of getting selected for the world championships is the best. So there's a lot of Brits in this race. And I think that coming off of a fat, again, like it's so hard to extrapolate a 3K to a 10K. May I say impossible? I've run a good 3K. I would run shit for 10K. <laughs> like I would, I'd probably get lapped by these guys. So like... I mean, we watch a guy like a Ben Blankenship, and I'm not saying that he ran a crap 10K, but he's run 736 for 3K and ran 28.05, 28 low for 10K. It's like they don't they don't equate. On the times table, they're not the same performance. And so it's a, a bit of a different beast to tackle, but I know that Sam has run a decent 10K, um, not necessarily on par with his 5K and 3K accolades that he's just racked up recently. Um, but it's someone that I see also coming in super confident and, you know, he, I can see nothing but the BU experiences of people just bu like pumping up their balloons and they like, everyone's just going to come in thinking that I'm the best and I can, I'm like infallible. I can do whatever I want. And so I do, I think that there's going to be some potentially ridiculous moves made like the rabbit steps off and then we just go faster from there. Like this was almost like a NASCAR event, like a safety <laughs> car. And we're like, okay, everyone's back in line. Just don't go any faster. Than that. And now go like the, it's like the flags are down and, and go nuts. But uh, yeah, I how think Sam people, might be your, your Josh Kerr in this. How many people do you think will be there at 8k? Like if there are a lot of these guys in contention here, are we going to, is it going to be a two man race at that point? Is it going to be uh, a bigger group? Uh, I forecast it being between seven and 10 people will be there at AK. Wow. Des, does yeah, all of this, I, I think that, without... sorry, we'll go ahead. You, you had a thought and then we'll no, does all of it. Does all of it drive with what? Does all of this jive with your thinking and how the race is going to, going to play out? Nothing changes my, like we can talk top five all day. Top one <laughs> is Joe Clucker. I, I, Joe Clucker wins I'm this race. Um, I love that. I think you gave great arguments. I'm intrigued by Grijalva's 10K. I think his 5K at Worlds was phenomenal. He's just on the up and up. He has the, you go back to self belief. That performance there on the biggest stage. I'm excited to see what he can do at the distance. If I I cannot agree with you more. Luigi is probably my favorite. I mean, like. All Under Armour athletes, notwithstanding, Louis G is my favorite runner, professional runner in the game right now. Like, I love him so much. On the start, like, his smile is radiant. He's just like, when he speaks, it's so pure. It's so from the heart. His brotherhood with Abdi Nur <laughs> is just like, it's the best, it's the single best thing that happened for me last year at World Championships, the two of them on the start line of the 5K final. Like, just like the the coolest dudes ever. I just want to be friends with them. I'm just like old enough to be their dad. So it's weird <laughs> that I want to be friends with them, but it's it's not impossible, highly unlikely. Um, I think, uh, can we, Jeff, I jumped the gun last time. Can I start to go through my top five? Yeah, please. Yeah, lay it out. Louis G, Louis G is getting second in this 10K. Okay. So you get I I, yeah. So and what, I think, he, I think I that Luigi runs. Yeah. Sorry, I yes. keep stepping on you. Go ahead, Will. It's okay. What do you hear me say? <laughs> because I'm I'm completely speaking from zero experience and pure desire. This is how <laughs> I want things to shake out. 
this is how it, but that's how it happened in, at Wanamaker too. You went straight from the heart, you said, and then yeah, it came to fruition. So. Yeah, but like I'd run that race before, you know, mm -hmm. and we'd seen other mile races, so I had a, like that was a bit easier. This is a 10k in March. Did we have any idea that Grant Fisher was going to run as fast? He did? No, no idea. No, I and from what so from what I hear you saying is. Joe Klecker is a consistent racer and he's, he's a strength guy and he he's going to be tough and he's going to lay it out there every time. What worries me about Woody and has, has always worried me is, is that thing going to be there when he needs it? That, that wild red eyed crazed kick that he has. And, and it has come more often than I think it will, but the straight hand that Joe Klecker plays, the driving just to ex exhaustion, is more reliable, you believe, than the the shoot from the hip at the end kind of 25-second 200 that he's just able to throw out there. Is that what I mean? He pulls it out of God knows where. So but, I think the 5K, even when it's, like, very, very fast, is just short enough that you can, like, gut your way through that part of the race that makes you like we forget what it feels like to run a 5k because your brain will not allow you to remember that discomfort right and so like but it's it's for a short enough period of time that you can bite down on something go to a deep dark place and 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 then he has this what he has this ability right to just like throttle but you only see that with Woody when he can win. You don't see that for second. You don't see well, that for third. You saw it second last year in the 5K at USA's. When Grant Fisher shot up. Corrected. You're absolutely right. But I think there was a, that was like a team to make, right? It's That's uh, all. ever so slightly different. Um, and so I think Woody also is a really smart guy. He knows that he doesn't need to run... 2659. Um, and I, Des, I think to your point with Louis G, the number of times that we've seen people run extraordinary, who are like, obviously they have the credentials to back it up, that run an extraordinary debut 10K is sort of innumerable. Yeah. Because it's like, yeah, I'm just going to go do this. You don't know what thing. you're getting into. And also, but for a guy like Louis G, who probably wants to double at World Champs, like, you got to believe that Mike Smith is saying, Go run twenty seven oh nine or twenty seven ten zero zero. You don't have to run another one. You don't need your ranking after that. You just need whatever it is. And so I think like if a guy like Sam Atkin makes that move and is that Josh Kerr, I think a Louis G is the guy that goes behind him. Yeah. I think Joe Klecker might just be very, very fine biding his time and then making like a fairly aggressive move with four or five with laps Woody to go. right on his heels. And, you think so? <laughs> yeah. yeah yes. Let's hear how you think. Let's how you. Yeah. Let's hear how you think this thing's going to shape up, and then let's hear your picks. Yeah, I I feel like I did not dig into the men's quite as well, but I love everything Will is saying. I think, and I, this goes is going to roll into the women too. But like, when do athletes from on step on the track and look off? Pardon the metaphor there, but like. They're always on, right? Like these guys, when they're at an event, they're ready to go. And I think, you know, Klecker won the U.S. Championship last year in the 10K. There's a little bit of ownership. Like this is my event. I got a little bit to prove um, more so than last year. And he's clearly primed and ready to go. So I think that he's he's the guy that should win. Um, but there's just so many players that are around him and, you know, I have no idea how it's going to shake out. I just hope there's like six guys with 1200 to go. It'd be amazing. <laughs> oh, we all do. Yeah. Uh, that'd be wild. Let's, uh, so how do you think that that'll play out at the end? Let's just hear your breakdown. Who do you have first, second, third, fourth, fifth there? Is Will, is Will going first or am I? Uh, you, Des. Okay. Oh, gosh. Let me pull up my list here. Um, I mean, I think it's going to be Kincaid. It's going to be Klecker. It's going to be Grijalva. Um, 
can Kip do have that type of breakthrough? I don't know what his training's like. I haven't. He, he looked great in the half, right? In Houston, but that's a big step down. Um, those are my top three. I, I can't go deeper than that. I haven't studied this as well as Will has. Okay. All right. I'll 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 give you my top five. In first place, from my the sister city of Minnetonka, Minnesota, Hopkins, is Joe Clucker. In second place is also Joe Clucker. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Big man. Uh, I, I, I see Louis G being when, – when Joe Clucker makes a pretty aggressive move to say, like, bye-bye to Woody after what he did to him in BU, um, I think Louis G it will be the person in this race with the least amount of experience and the most amount of ability to go with him. Um, and so I think Louis G covers that move, follows him uh, to second-place finish. Woody is going to be regretting running 25 laps. Um, after sort of polishing himself as a, a 3K, 5K guy this year indoors. Um, but it's going to come in a strong third and probably close a lot of gap on Luigi, but just narrowly miss him at the line. Um, Sam Atkin is going to come home in fourth place after doing a lot of the work after 5K. And everyone's going to applaud his effort because thanks to him, they'll probably have run something pretty quick. And, and, Honestly, this is this is really where my big gap comes in as well. Like fifth place, who would I love to see? I'd love to see Ben Flanagan have a breakthrough. I know that he's run some pretty good five Ks this year. And like as it's just weird, like in that ten K to seven mile range, and we see him win Falmouth year in and year out. Like he's just like pretty strong on the roads. Um, I'd love to see him put one together and just but be in a place where like I think fifth place in this race comes from the second pack. I think that uh, whoever meters their effort the best when the top dogs start to fight amongst each other um, will have a lot of bodies to eat up over the last 800 meters. And I think fifth place comes from the second pack. And uh, my guess is it's it's Ben Flanagan or Patrick Deaver. Um, and Patrick Deaver is going to be trying to claw back Sam Atkin and – narrowly miss because there's blood in the water and all those guys are going to be hungry chomping at the bit. That's my bet. Even Sounds though like I did it. say a non-definitive fifth, I think Ben Flanagan gets six fifth because, okay. I like that. He's, he's got some, some interesting um, results this indoor season too. And some that if, if he does come up from that second pack, um, he might be a good guy to be able to do that, biding his time. He ran 12, 221 in the K this indoor season, which is nuts for a like a road racer. It's it's crazy. For a half marathon guy. What's Ronnie doing over there? What's Ronnie yeah. doing over there? <laughs> what, yeah, what's Ron- Yeah, they're definitely working on their arms. I can tell you that. <laughs> he, the arm carriage will be on point. If the, if you start seeing the falter. Ronnie might just yank him off the track. Damn it. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm not making picks this time too, because I'll be calling the races, but I, uh, I do agree with your, your perspective on, on Joe Klecker too. I think he's a near lock for top three. Like he's just, he's a guy who's going to be there. He's very consistent. I think it's equally like Woody could get first. He could be out of the top five. I think there's, I hate to say it, but there's kind of an equal, uh, yeah, it could equally be one of those too. But I love the guy. Uh, what, man, what do you mean? No, you want to get just, you he's, think he, he there's no way he's out of the top. I mean, like, unless, come hell or high water, well, he's, Woody's top five. Unless he, like, ex- gets And the time the still matters. Like, it's like, even if the racing goes away, like, you still want to get the mark so you can. And, and beat the people that are trying to get points and all of the stuff. Like you can't just sandbag at home. Like he'll be, he'll have reasons to exactly. fight. And he's a fighter. Boom. He's a fighter. Yeah. Put him up. But, and, and I know we, we didn't mention a lot of, a lot of contenders in this race too. So if you have a, if you have somebody who you think we didn't mention, you can go and make your own picks too at trackland.com. So we encourage you, everybody listening to do that. Um, that's the men's race. You heard it here. Make sure you watch it on March 4th. Let's move on to the women's race here because it is 
equally exciting. Uh, it's yeah. more. It, it's more exciting. It is okay. more exciting. More. The women's race is more hands down more exciting. Okay. All right. Well, let's. Uh, I'm gonna. I'm gonna list off a few of the uh, the top contenders here, and then we can dig into it. We got Alicia Munson. Uh, Eilish McColgan is a is a recent add to the field here. Uh, Elise Cranny is a, a recent drop. Natasha Rogers is in this. Dom Scott, Ellie Hennis making her debut. Edna Kurgat, Sarah Inglis, Taylor Werner, and the, the list goes on and on. Des, set this thing up for us. Who are the major players here? Let's hear your thoughts. Yeah, I mean, I think you listed off a lot of the key ones. I think it's an interesting race because of people coming in from different angles. Like you have some people coming off of cross who just traveled to Australia and now they're coming back. You have um, folks who hit the BU track and they're super confident would have the BU bounce going on where, you know, everything just seems easier there. And does that make you overconfident? Is that the right timing for this race? You know? Um, and then you have, folks who are really great 10k runners who are prepping for a marathon like a connor mance on the men's side um Ailish mcclugan is getting ready for london so can she be super strong and super fit and she has you know i think the best seed time but where is she at in that training and is she just bogged down in mileage and how do the legs respond so there's a ton of great names um and i'm going to go the way Will went, where there's one just standout who should win, and that's uh, Munson. I mean, I think, you know, what she's been doing on the track has been phenomenal. She's not afraid to go to the front and push from a long way out. Um, and, you know, you saw her at the trials in the 10K just go so deep into the well and get that spot. She's someone you can hurt for a really long time. And I think she's leveled up. Like, we saw what she did indoors last year. I think she's taking a jump and she's going to have um, a phenomenal race and just be the person to beat. So does she latch onto the super hot pace and get in way overhead? Maybe. I don't think anyone can beat Munson, but Munson. It's my take. Ooh, hot take. <laughs> Sound the alarms, Will. So that's, <laughs> well, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Turn that fire alarm on. Um, that's who we've been kind of calling the capo to cut to uh, take a cycling term. It's uh, who who is going to dictate the race and who all of the other racers in the field look to as somebody who they have to. This person is going to make the moves, and if I'm going to make a move, I'm really thinking about that person if I'm going to do it. So it seems like that's the way things have been gearing for her coming off the tail end of last year too, where. She had some great racing over in Europe uh, that, what, 3,000, I believe, the, the, the Diamond League, uh, where she, she got that narrow second. Yeah. Um, but And then, in obviously, in, in Milrose, too, what she did in the 3,000 there. Like, she is, she's dictating these races, too. So is there, is there anybody who can match her here, undermine her efforts? It, it sounds like you, you already said no, too. <laughs> well, I, I mean, no, sorry to jump in. Not my race <laughs> to call. However, <laughs> I just learned that you just, you just can't bet against Natasha Rogers. Like mm. she is tenacious. And I was, we were talking about the BU 5k that she ran a, a few weeks back. And one of my friends, like he's not a runner, but he is a <laughs> running Stan was like, I was like, I don't understand how she does it. And he just, he said to me point blank, she loves pain. She gets off on pain and you can see it when she runs and it's like 10 K what better event. <laughs> and so like a little bit and, and what better than like a 10 K where you are going out at the, I mean, unrelenting pace, right? Like What's we're the talking 1508. No, six. Mm. Yeah, my boulder, my boulder moles are telling me different. I heard I was here in fifteen flat, but well, uh, maybe that happens, maybe it doesn't. It seems psycho. That seems psycho. Anybody who latches onto that is going to have a long 
25 laps feels like 37. That's, that's a tough <laughs> layer. I mean, I, I hope I'm wrong. That would be really amazing to see and then, you know, get in there and, and be able to bring it home. But you're right. Natasha is someone who knows how to suffer. And I mean, she just lopped off 12 seconds off her 5,000 PB. Um, and she's got two, two teammates in there with her. So everyone's working against each other. They might have some type of dynamic where it's like, okay, we, we can let the pacer go for a little bit and work together or, you know, kind of just match up with each other for a while. So I, th I think that will play to their advantage as well. Yeah, we saw Whitney Orton Morgan move up on, um, on Munson in Milrose too, in that 3K. Is that something that we can kind of see with this, this Puma race or Puma group with the three athletes in there? You have, uh, Taylor Werner and Sarah Inglis, or, or Fiona O'Keefe, <laughs> sorry, and um, and Natasha. Would they? Is that something we can see them working together if they don't go to the pacer and then move up on Munson later on in the race? Or do you think they're going to try to latch on from the start? I think everyone's just going to latch on, right? That's why you go to Jay Sarah. That's why you go to the 10. That's why... I mean, it's same as Stanford. There's, there is still the element of time and it's like, I want the big PB and I want the bonus that comes with it. But, you know, if it's too rich, it's, that's when the racing becomes really compelling because you have the chase group and you have the battles of who could just hang on the longest. And I think if you have teammates in that scenario, it becomes a little bit easier because I work out with them all the time. I suffer with them all the time. If they're still hanging I can definitely hang because I do this every day in practice where if you're out there on your own, it's just like I'm hurting. They must feel better than I do. Are there any dark horses in this race that, that could come up and make something happen? We, we talked about uh, Grijalva in the men's race, but it, it's funny how all these things can shift in, in our minds too, in the, in the zeitgeist where all it takes is one race for somebody to become king or queen of the mountain and uh that's like with that the point i was trying to make with the bu 5k and woody and, and joe is that that very well could have been joe but woody just had this crazy kick at the end and then everybody's talking about woody and joe's dare i say flying under the radar ever so slightly because of that uh, but yeah who are those who are those people that could potentially steal the limelight here are there any? or is monster just too strong i, I think edna kurgat will be really interesting i mean she looks great at cross and when Kalati is not a slouch and she you know she handled that pretty well and i think there's an interesting um strength component and just racing component that comes with cross where you learn how to go to the well a little bit deeper and that's what she's going to need to do if she be can try and beat Munson and put up a fight there. So um, she's a sleeper for sure. And she's obviously right in the mix in terms of PB and, and the whole thing. So we didn't mention her, but she should be mentioned. And I think someone who will be kind of fun to watch, who's been really progressing quite a bit is uh, Susan Sullivan. I mean, she's a marathoner, 225, and, um, but she steps down quite often and has put up some really fast marks. So I don't know that she's been – how many track – 10 Ks and fast opportunities, opportunities she's had. Um, do I think she'll mix it up at front? Probably not, but will she surprise a lot of people and put up another good mark? I, I think so. Absolutely. Well, let's uh, give me your assessment <laughs> assessment here. Yeah. I think that when you are showing up to a race with your own rabbit, basically, even if you don't explicitly say it with the intention of going after the American record that like, good luck, everybody else, you know, like, is there a dark horse in this race? Not coming after Alicia. Sorry. Like there just isn't. And can we talk about the email? Can we talk about the waiver wire? What we've been hearing through the, can we bring it up yet? Wait, what email with, with some of the scratches, your email. Oh yeah, there's there's been some scratches. Yeah, so I I don't I don't need to name names, but some of the heavy hitters in this race have pulled out at the in the last week, um, which to me makes the upfront much less interesting, but it makes 
that race for second. Incredibly interesting. We've got Alish and Dom both prepping for a marathon. Um, so arguably you could say like, this is maybe the fittest that they've ever entered a 10 K right? Like the pace is going to be hot for them compared to marathon pace, which it does can speak to this much better than I can of like how much intentional training you do in the marathon for like locking into being comfortable running that pace versus like what's 10 K pace, 15, 20 seconds a mile faster. Um, that's a pretty significant jump. And so like, I, I love this field for second through fifth. Um, I, I think that you're going to, Natasha Rogers is just a tenacious competitor and will probably try and run with Alicia for as long as she can. But the difference between a 30 minute 10 K and a 31 minute 10 K are like, it's just night and day, right? You're, you're, you're looking at different ends of the spectrum of like of time. Um, and, and so my hope for this race is that Alicia proving building her season upon the results from indoors goes out and, and runs somewhere near that American record. And I think Natasha Rogers, I have yet to see her like completely, like, at least in the recent past, like fall apart. So like, I think that she's probably going to go out right on her heels because that's just what she's want to do. Um, and I think that that Puma group, I mean, we saw it indoors is going to be a tough bunch behind her. Um, and, and hopefully if, in the event that the wheels do start to fall off a little bit, if her teammates come up behind her, that's like gives you a bit of a second wind, which I know is like extremely hard to talk about in a 10 K when you're, when things are going South, it's more like, Oh, you're going past me. Well, I'll see you guys in a few laps at the finish line. But, um, I, I love the idea of, of that. I mean, you said they're just, they're so strong. You have a lot of people who are sort of like not 10 K specialists coming in this event. And as Des was talking about, like, you're at an event with the intention of, of competing and running fast. You, you know, it can be done there. It's the old Stanford mentality of like, whether or not that track was fast or not, you saw people run fast there. And so you believe that it's a place that you can run fast. Um, and getting into the pure competitiveness of it, like who is more wildly competitive than Emily Lapari? <laughs> like she bites tooth and nail flails herself to these finishes that you're just like, wait, like, where are you coming from? Um, I and I heard that she's in a decent, sorry. I believe she is a scratch. Oh, Australia. so I'm sorry. Both that's, Emily's are out. That's tough. Yeah. Well, All right. Yeah. Well, this foils my entire plan. Uh, I do like Edna Kurgat, um, coming in top three, but I also really like Ellie Hennis. Another uh, going back to my point of like, Someone coming in, and, and here's the thing with Ellie. Ellie ran with so much confidence this indoor season. I feel like training has to be going well. And it was more like these races are, they're too short. And so, like, the goal between her and Mike Smith is, like, let's do a bunch of training that leads us to believe, like, that we're gearing towards a 10K. Let's put these races in to break up the training a little bit and get that stimulus. Like, so the first time that you're putting on your new kit, is not in San Juan Capistrano, right? And, and so you saw the way that she raced this indoor season, which was like hard from the front with intent. You don't do that if you if like things haven't been clicking in training. And so my belief with her is that uh, I see her finishing third, um, but running a pretty extraordinary race and like probably doing it in a bit more metered way of like, I'm out here doing my own thing. I'm gonna run my own race. I'm not gonna try and go out and, 1509 or 1508 or 15 flat, whatever the on train says that they're going to do, um, <laughs> but comes up and, and, and finishes in third. And, and I know that I just said a lot of different names, but I think that we're going to see Alicia win the race, Natasha Rogers, even if she falls apart from K's five to eight or nine, I don't know. She's going to hit that Mario star with like a K or two to go and dip, 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 and just like claw our way back to a second place finish. And I see Ellie finishing in third. That'd be okay. interesting. I think with that, that, no, hot on her heels. I, I, this uh, past year and this end of the, the season, I believe Hennis beat Rogers over 5k and broke 15 before Rogers did. So that, I mean, that would be a nice little battle late in the race. I hope that pans out that way. Yeah. Yeah. Good shot. Was that on uh, the J. Sarah track too? I think it might have been. 
at like the was, track meet last year. I thought it was in Berlin, but you could be right. I thought it was yeah, Berlin. I know that Ellie ran close to 15, if not under okay. the track meet, but beside the point. Let's, uh, Des, how do you think this race is going to shape up? Give us your, give us your play by play and then your top. Fine. Oh gosh. Well, I I mean I think we're all in agreement here that Monson's going to do Monson things. She's going to be out front trying to do something different. Um and so I'm going to give her the one spot and that's one race that's happening and then again we have this big pack of um contenders that are trying to go fast but they're also trying to be the best of the rest or be in position to pick up the scraps if it all goes sideways for Monson. Um, I think we mentioned a lot of those names in McCoolgan, Kurgat, Rogers, O'Keefe, English, and I think Dom Scott. I would love a little inside info on Dom Scott. I think she, you know, in the marathon training, but um, she's so good. I mean, like, she's got the turnover. She's run the great half. She's run the great 10. Um, so that, I think she'll be in the mix as well. There's just so much strength at that point in your marathon build that I think she'll at least be there for 8K. Um, you know, and then it's like, how heavy are the legs for mileage? So I see that big pack just sticking together. Um, I do agree that Rogers will be aggressive. I think she might find herself split from, uh, months in really early and go like, maybe have a moment where it's like, I got to get to the end of this thing, um, run in no man's land. But I think when that group catches Rogers, which in my mind, that's how this is going to happen. They're going to kind of regroup with her that's she's just a fighter like i think that she'll be on the front of that group i think she'll drive the train of that group and make things happen for everyone in that pack so um i think she'll ultimately end up breaking it open late and we'll have monson out front rogers with uh angles and i'm gonna go kirigat running the last couple laps together and just in a fight for a for a big kick late that's my that's my play right. play. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds yeah. good. That's uh that's the assessment for the the race play out here. I I remember I keep going back to Monson's run twenty twenty one in the, the ten thousand at, at Olympic trials and how it was what like a hundred and twenty <laughs> degrees on the track or something like that. And uh and she had to go to the hospital after that because of taken herself to the well as much as she did. And that just seemed like such a, a Dathan athlete thing to do. Like, no, it seemed like Dathan more than a lot of people knew if that red line is the first down marker, um, like on the football field and, and only he can see it. He knew where it was more than anybody else. And it seems like Munson has that too. Maybe, maybe not quite because, uh, well, she, she went over it, but, uh, she's, she's able to dig into the well more than a lot of people. And it's, it's amazing to watch. Yeah. It's something in Boulder. I mean, it, it's exactly what Klecker looked like after that 5,000 meters. I mean, there's, there's a mindset thing that's being tapped into and, um, Dathan's definitely getting those people to just find a little bit more in the tank when, you know, push comes to shove late in the race. Yeah. All right. Well, those are your picks from the experts from Des Linden, Will Lear. Thank you guys so much for, for jumping on here and, and giving your assessment of these, these races that are going to take place on Saturday. Where are you going to be watching? From my couch. <laughs> same, same, same. All right. <laughs> Okay. Unfortunately, not in San Juan Capistrano, where the women instinctively flock. Um, how have we not made that joke yet? <laughs> I don't know. That's a thank. Thanks for That's doing it. Goes it goes over the heads of most people. <laughs> uh, broadcast starts at six fifteen p.m. If you're there, you can come in person, but wear a coat. It gets chilly there. It's a little damp by the coast, but perfect running weather. Um, thanks again, guys. Tune in uh, at tracklen.com and you can purchase your tickets for $5.99. Remember, $4 of that goes straight into the purse. All right. That's it. See you next time.